Everybody looking forward to Christmas? Oh, it, it's <laughs> it is almost here. And so uh, my name is Chris Aiden. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Heritage. And we're just so excited um, for this, this series, Anticipating Christmas, because that's seriously what we all are doing right now, just anticipating those moments with our family, those moments with maybe some snow, who knows. Um, it, it's just an incredible season, one of my favorites. And so I just want to welcome anybody here who's here for the first time, all of y'all that are listening online. Um, thank you for tuning in today. Um, today we're going to go through the second part of the series. Um, last week, Pastor Matt talked about um, the types of Christ's, the types of Jesus's that we see um, in the Old Testament and how those um, events foreshadowed what was to be. And today we're going to look a little bit into the prophecies and look into those things that, that we can look at and just go, you know what, this gives me assurance. Because when I, when I was growing up, I used, to, I used to see this whole Christmas thing and I, I, I understood the Jesus thing in two different places. I understood the Jesus that showed up on my TV somewhere around March or April, and he was the, the British Jesus with blue eyes that never blinked and walked at three-quarter speed, and, and that was the Jesus that I grew up with. And I was like, all right, that guy's a cool guy. That guy's an amazing teacher. Um, he's a little scrawny, but that's okay. And that's the Jesus I knew, and this guy did something um, to get himself executed, and that was a horrible, horrible, horrible way to die. And that was that. And then when Christmas rolled around, I was introduced to Jesus number two, or actually Jesus number one. And it was this little wooden figurine that sat um, in a little wooden manger thing, which I didn't know what a manger was, still barely do, and, and, and sat on top of my grandma's big brown TV. Remember those TVs where you had to flip dials? And after about a year, you got those pliers and you just... <laughs> Some of the young ones don't get that. They don't, they don't understand that when you wanted to change um, TV, you actually had to get up out of your chair and, and grab the pliers and, and, and switch the TV. Watched a lot more commercials back then. But those are my two different Jesuses. And, and it took a long time for me to connect the dots. And I went through a long time of trying to understand, well, is this Jesus real or is this just another story? Is this Jesus real, or is this something that is going to go away? Because when I look at it, it looks like he's just a man. He looks like he's just a person, just like me. What makes him so significant? Last March, we went through a series called Under Fire, and we walked through pretty in-depth on how we can know with a surety that Jesus is who he says he is. And we open this series with, does God exist? And, and before we start anything, you always got to figure out, well, does God exist? Is there a supreme being out there? Is there a first cause to everything that we see? And if there is, what's my next step? And if there is a first cause, what's his name? Is it Allah? Is it Vishnu? Is it Yahweh? Who is this God? And how can I be sure that this is authentic? And this isn't just another religious tale written a long time ago when people didn't have science. How can I be sure that what is written in the pages of this book, which is what Bible means, Bible literally means book. A holy Bible is a holy book. How do I know this is different than Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Narnia? Today I want to talk about prophecies and why they are so incredibly important in understanding this. Why they are so incredibly important to give us a foundation to build everything else on. Because if this isn't a sure foundation, I would be home watching football. My life would be different. And today I invited a skeptic. 
She's from Pleasant Grove, by the way. Congratulations, congratulations, Pleasant Grove. Talk about anticipation. First time going for the state championship, and there hasn't been a close game yet. And so th this is exciting. So she's going to be my skeptic. Not that all PG people are skeptics, but it was the first shirt I, I found over there. So let's go ahead and start in a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you that we live in a country that grants us the opportunity to meet together, to worship together. Heavenly Father, I, I just pray that as we open your word, that you will illuminate exactly what you want us to see, what you want us to hear. And Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's those out there that maybe are still struggling with the whole idea of, is this Jesus real? Is he really the Lord our God? Heavenly Father, I just pray that you enlighten them today. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So we pick up the story, the Old Testament, 39 books of the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament is written in a span of about 1,000 years, dating all the way back. And if you were part of our junior high or high school, we spent the entire summer walking through a timeline about um, how each and every piece of the Bible fits into a perfect little timeline so we can remember. And so we, we understand that, that the, the writing of the Old Testament be, began somewhere around 1500 B.C., and it continued on all the way until about 500, 400 B.C. And then there was a gap. A 400-year gap of silence. There was no prophet. There was no written word. Just silence. And as Pastor Matt talked about last week, there were many different signs. And as we'll talk about today, there are many different prophecies of this Messiah that is going to come and, and reconnect us with God. This Messiah that has been promised. And then everything goes silent. And it's easy for us as we look through scriptures that were written in antiquity to go, oh, 400 years, not that big a deal. Well, 400 years ago was four years before our first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims. How things have changed in North America over the last 400 years. Imagine generation after generation anticipating, hoping for some kind of hint that this Messiah would show up. And what were they waiting for? What, is, what does this Messiah mean? Well, it literally means the anointed one. Whenever you hear Messiah, it means anointed one for the Hebrews. What does anointed one mean in Greek? Anybody know? Christ. Messiah and Christ are synonymous. It's the same word in two different languages. Messiah is the anointed one to the Hebrews. In fact, the Hebrews would never have said Jesus Christ. They, they would have said, Yeshua Mashiga, or Yeshua HaMashiga, which is Jesus the Messiah. And those who spoke Greek would have said, Jesus Christos. They were waiting for this Mashiach, or this Christos. And after 400 years, the silence was broken by John the Baptist just as prophecy foretold. And see, the question has never been whether Jesus existed. Now, there's some wingnuts that have dropped their academic hat at the door who now are trying to say that Jesus never existed. Don't go to their college. <laughs> Graham Stanton from Cambridge University said, Today... Nearly all historians, whether Christians or not, accept that Jesus existed and that the Gospels contain plenty of valuable evidence which has been weighed and assessed critically. It's from Cambridge University. Oxford University follows suit. The historical evidence for Jesus himself is extraordinarily good. 
From time to time, people try to suggest that Jesus of Nazareth never existed, but virtually all historians of whatever background now agree he did. So the question isn't, did Jesus exist? He existed. There's more historical evidence for Jesus' existence as there is for Napoleon's. For you younger ones, that's not dynamite. It's Bonaparte. There's more evidence (laughs) for Jesus' existence than Napoleon Bonaparte's. But the question is, was he the Messiah? Was he the Christ? Was he the anointed one? In other words, was he God? Was he the word that became flesh and dwelt among us? That's the rub. How do we know? If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And in the youth, we always challenge our students um, to bring their Bibles. I tell them, never trust anything I say unless you have this to back it up. Or if you have one of those incredibly smartphones, you can use that too. Always bring your Bible. Keep you from drinking Kool-Aid in the jungle somewhere. The young ones won't get that one either. (laughs) And here's what it says. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this, listen to this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary as his wife. But he did not consummate the marriage until she had given birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when he rose, or when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod, or when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. So he asked them, what did the prophet say? Where was he supposed to be born again? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd." to my people in Israel. So the question is, how do we know that's legit? Our skeptics are going to want to know, how do we know that's legit? Because that's a cool story. It's a little weird, but it's a cool story. How do we know that that really happened? And it all comes down to trust. Because if we look at these prophecies and we believe them, it gives us a little bit of trust, a lot of trust, actually. I remember when I was young, my, my uncle, who's no longer my uncle, long story, <laughs> he walked in, and I, I'm a big Angel fan, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, or whatever they decide to call their team next year. And I, I was so excited just to, to be, and I, I had never been to an angel game. And my uncle walked in, and, and I was sitting on the couch, and he laid these tickets on my lap. And they were two tickets to the Angels-Yankees. And I was like, ah! 
And I freaked out. I was like, I grabbed him like, yes, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much. And, and, and he looked, and I know in his heart he thought this would be funny, and it probably was. He said, oh, those aren't for you. And I was just like, oh. And I was just like, oh, oh, man. these are so cool. And I didn't even know what to say. And he let it go for a little while. He's like, oh, I'm just kidding. They're for you. And I was like, yay. I, I was still so shocked. And, and it's weird because that's such a weird little thing in my life that I still remember today. But to this day, if someone says, hey, this is for you, my reaction is real stoic, real quiet. I'm like, oh. Because I'm really hesitant to put myself in that position again. And it's so weird, just a little thing like that. It's amazing what little things can do to change a student's trajectory. I lost all trust in what it meant to receive a gift. What the prophecies do is give us Complete trust. Now let's start breaking down these prophecies and how we can know. Here's the first thing you need to understand about the prophecies and about Christianity that separates Christianity from any other belief system. Christianity is the only religion or belief system that didn't start with one person coming up with everything privately. It didn't start with one man having a private interview with an angel telling him everything. It didn't start with one man having a private dream or one man coming up with a bunch of great because those private meetings are impossible to verify. Some guy could come out and go, hey, God told me last night. I put my head in something and boom, this is what we are to believe. Everybody needs to follow me. Or this is what God told me. That if we do this and we do that and we follow this, we will get to heaven or we will experience nirvana or we whatever it is. It's all impossible to verify. Christianity is the only belief system that doesn't start with a private meeting, but it starts with a public testimony. It starts way back as God uses prophets, as God uses prophets, and what a prophet is, it's someone who is a mouthpiece of God. Someone who is going to utter the very words of God. And listen to what Jesus says about this. This is really cool. John chapter 5, verse 31. And it says this, If I testify about myself, My testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. Jesus was saying, if I'm telling you that I'm God, how are you going to believe that? You can't verify that. If, If the only testimony I have comes from me, it doesn't weigh with any kind of of power. And he goes on in verse 39. And he's looking at the Pharisees. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And look what he says. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. He's looking at a bunch of skeptics who have spent their entire life studying the scriptures. And they think that in this law, they're going to have some kind of life. And Jesus is all, you've been studying this. You should be able to recognize that these are about me. And then he goes on. But do you think I will accuse you before the Father? No, your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are all set. You see, these people, all their hopes were based on legalism, on the law, and they thought, man, this law, if I do it just perfectly, if I live just accordance, I will get to heaven. And they put their anchor 
on these hopes. But then look what Jesus says in verse 46. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Jesus is saying, again, my testimony, even though it's true, how are you going to believe? Because it's just my word. But what I want you to do is I want you to look in those scriptures that you know were written 1,500 years ago. 1,500 years ago, Moses wrote about me. He wrote about my birth. He wrote about how it would come about, where it would come about. Imagine that. He's saying, go look at what the prophets say. Because if you read it and you compare what they said to what has happened, you will believe. You will have full assurance. You will have a foundation to stand on. And it was a, it was a tricky thing to be a prophet. It was a tricky thing. You had to be right. A hundred percent of the time. Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 says this. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. But I was nine out of ten. Stone him. Got to be a hundred percent. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, this is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. It's pretty harsh. Could you imagine being correct nine out of ten times? And being a complete failure, deserving a death? Because someone who's right nine out of ten times missed one. And if you miss one, your words are not of God because God is perfect. God is all-knowing. Our family every year does a football pool. And it's been happening for, I don't know, 30 years. And this year there were 70 different entries. 70 different entries where we had to pick all 41 bowl games against the spread out of all 70 entries I looked last night how many bowl games were yesterday five one person is five for five one person is five for five next week it'll go down to zero the odds of picking 41 bowl games correctly are astronomical. In fact, Warren Buffett a couple years ago took a big risk and he offered a billion dollar reward for anyone who can get a perfect March Madness bracket. It's never been done in the history of the world. That sounds big. It's only been happening for about 50 years, but it's never been done. No one has ever guessed the entire March Madness bracket, the odds are astronomical. However, if you're going to say that God told, told me that Ohio State's going to win, ooh, you better be right. Unfortunately, I was a false prophet somewhere in Iowa <laughs> and Oklahoma. <laughs> Prophecies in the Bible are God's fingerprint. They are letting us know that this is legit. And it gives validation to anything it talks about. I want you to check this video out. The chances that two people will have the same fingerprint is about 1 in 64 billion. That's why fingerprints are used in criminal cases, because they are considered near certain proof. What if it was possible to be that certain about Jesus? What would qualify as proof of Jesus' divine nature? If there were prophecies that were accurate, 
specific, written before the events happened, which couldn't be fulfilled on purpose, and less likely to happen than a one chance in 64 billion, then the case for the divine nature of Jesus could be called proven by modern legal standards. For your consideration, I give you Exhibit 1. The Messiah would be a descendant of Abraham, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, written in the 600s BC. Based on world population estimates, any random person has less than a 1 in 350 chance of being the right race to fulfill this prophecy. Number 2. The Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. That's Genesis 49.10, which was written in the 900s BC. And the Messiah would be a descendant of David. That's 2 Samuel 7.12, written in the 500s BC. The odds that any given descendant of Abraham could fulfill this prophecy is about a 1 in 10 chance. Number 3. The Messiah would arrive while the temple was still standing. That's in Malachi 3.1, written in the 400s. And the Messiah would be revealed by 33 AD. That's in Daniel 9 and written in the 500s. Any person who has lived since then had a 1 in 16 chance of being born close enough to this date. Number 4. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah 5.2, written in the 700s BC. There was a 1 in 3,968 chance of a Roman era Jew being born in the right place to fulfill this prophecy. Number five, the Messiah would be wounded and pierced before his death and would be assigned a grave with criminals. That's Isaiah 53, 5 through 9, written in the 700s BC. That has a one in 306 chance of being randomly fulfilled. Virtually all credible religious, agnostic, or atheist experts of history agree that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, a descendant of Abraham, Judah, and David, was alive during the Second Temple period, was hailed as Messiah by the crowd in 33 AD, was wounded and pierced before his death, and was assigned a grave with criminals. Historians also agree that the verses that predict these things were written down hundreds of years before Jesus' life. Calculated together, the probability of all these predictions being randomly fulfilled in one person is about a 1 in 68 billion chance. That means it's slightly less likely than two people having the same fingerprint, which is estimated at a 1 in 64 billion chance. So, if you trust a fingerprint as proof, you should trust Jesus too. That's just five prophecies. Five prophecies that were accurately foretold. There are well over 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ, and each and every one of them came true. Did you see the odds? Now, honestly, while studying this, I was like, so it is possible for two fingerprints? <laughs> 64 billion to one that there will be two people with the same fingerprint current population is 7.6 billion people on earth. Five prophecies come true, which has been verified by Christians, non-Christians, atheists, the whole thing. 68 million to one. 6.8 times 10 to the 10th power. What about eight prophecies coming true? Let's just add three more. What are the odds? Well, instead of 10 to the 10th power, it's 10 to the 17th power. That's 17 zeros. You've all heard this analogy, but I'm going to flip it up a little bit. Instead of silver dollars, I'm going to use thin mints because thin mints are of God. <laughs> Imagine you taking thin mints and spreading them all over the great state of Texas, two feet deep, and then taking one thin mint and licking all the chocolate off. <laughs> dropping it somewhere, anywhere, and then blindfolding me and dropping me in. By the way, this is my first hundred years of heaven I'm giving you right now. <laughs> dropping me in the batch of thin mints and letting me sniff out the one. <laughs> Ten with 17 zeros. 
eight prophecies. And this is crazy. You're catching that these were written 400 to 1,000 years before the events even happened. Not a single prophecy about Jesus is any closer than 400 years because of that 400 years of silence. That would be like someone 900 years ago prophesying about the birthplace of Donald Trump or President Obama. Got to keep it even. Uh, Imagine that. Someone accurately prophesying that Donald Trump would be born in New York. In New York. Thousand years ago. Before there was a New York. Before there was a United States of America. Before anybody who could have said that would have even known this continent existed. And yet being able to accurately go, yeah, Donald would be born here and there'd be shepherds. Of course, Donald would be all, there were many shepherds, but whatever, okay? (laughs) And I know all the Democrats are like, I just wish he wasn't born. (laughs) All the Republicans are wish, I wish we knew where Obama was born, whatever it is. Libertarians, give me a beer, whatever it is. But imagine the odds of that. And yet, over and 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 over again, prophets are accurately saying, Jesus, the Messiah, the Meshach will be born in Bethlehem. How does Jesus maneuver that, where he's going to be born? Because I know some skeptics, I, I know what she's thinking. Well, the whole donkey thing, Jesus actually went and found a donkey. Oh, I get that. How do you make the virgin birth happen? How do you make Bethlehem happen? How do you prophesy how Jesus would die 900 years before his death and 400 years before the method of his death was even invented? Imagine a thousand years ago, someone prophesying that this person would get the electric chair before it was even invented, before electricity was even invented. What it tells us is it's not man-made. It's God's voice. It's God's mouthpiece. And when God speaks, 100% of the time it's correct. 48 prophecies about Jesus being fulfilled. 10 to the 157th power. Imagine that number. You would have to write a one and just start going around the classroom Christmas story style. Zero, 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 zero. Until you get 157 zeros. That number is so ridiculous to comprehend. This is just 48. We haven't even got to 300 yet. Do you realize there's one quintillion atoms in a grain of sand? There's that many atoms in a tiny grain of sand. One quintillion. You have to Google how many zeros that is. Do you know how many atoms are in the known universe? 10 to the 82nd power. And yet the odds of Jesus fulfilling just 48 prophecies are 10 to the 157th power. At some point, skeptics need to just say, all right, it's impossible unless it was from God. I remember being on a mission trip and I was talking to a person about Jesus and he was a skeptic and going back and forth and we talked and we got into the prophecies and, and I was like, and I, I actually said, well, how, how could Jesus manipulate where he was born? And the guy said, well, it's not fair when God manipulates it for him. And I was like, what'd you just say? <laughs> and he's like, oh. Everything about Jesus is written very publicly, was demonstrated very publicly. It wasn't just said, and oh, please believe me. Pastor Matt talked about all the different types of Christ that were in the Old Testament showing us what was to become. 
over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that accurately tell us exactly what was to be. And Jesus came and fulfilled each one, proving and validating not only that he was God. And remember, the word became flesh about 2,000 years ago. But the word's been here since the beginning. It was the second part of the Trinity, the Son of God, that was in that burning bush talking to Moses, that was in that fiery furnace. That He's been active from the beginning. And the Word became flesh for you and me to give us an opportunity to have a relationship with the creator of the universe in a very public way. Peter in his very last word, says this. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things for prophecy never had its origin in the human will but prophets through humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit God's fingerprint is all over his word his word is testable it's reliable Christianity isn't about, hey, just believe us. Don't read this. No, read this. Test it. Put it to the test. Check out the odds. There's no other way. Last March, we talked about all these, these apologetic examples of how God has to be that first cause. There's no other rational way. And his word, verified through the prophets, gives that supreme being a name. And his name is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, he's the A to the Z, the beginning and the end. And skeptics can try all they want. You can't go against the verifiable data. It's a fingerprint. And if we would use a fingerprint... And that's just 64 billion. That's a tiny number. If you're going to use a fingerprint to be assured of something, I think 10 to the 157 is pretty assured. So my question to you, do we live as if we believe this? Or is it just another story we celebrate? What are we anticipating for Christmas? What do we celebrate at Christmas? Do we really understand that Christmas is about Jesus? And it's not about just this great teacher Jesus, this great prophet Jesus, this, this moral compass who is Jesus, this great writer. It is about the word becoming flesh, which gives all humanity, the opportunity to have a relationship, not religion, a relationship with the creator of the universe. Someone who loves us more than we will ever know. Someone who sees us exactly how he created us in the image of love. Someone who was there knitting us together in our mother's womb because we are fearfully and wonderfully made by a God who is love. And that's the image we have. The anticipation that people had for the Christ, the Messiah, was fulfilled. That's why the early church could not stop talking about Jesus. Everywhere they went, small group, every night. Church, every day. Work, hey, you want to know about Jesus? Is this Jesus thing real? I'm going to kill you. Kill me. 
I get to see my Jesus. The best gift that anybody can receive at Christmas has already been delivered. There's some of you that need to unwrap it. Because the gift is only yours when you open it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, which speaks truth, which gives us a foundation to build everything upon our lives, our dreams, our families, our church. We thank you that your word is 100% accurate and powerful. We thank you for the evidence that you gave us thousands of years ago, spoken through humans about this Messiah, about this Christ who would come. And Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us that hint as we open and anticipate this Christmas season. Give us the wisdom to see Jesus first, to celebrate his birth, which leads to the greatest story ever told. Heavenly Father, if there's someone in here or someone listening online that is still struggling with some things, that is still seeking, give them the wisdom to ask the questions, to put your word, to put the odds to the test. Because we know with 100% assurity that your word is accurate. And we give you all the glory. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.